Trevor, you've got a fan out there. They say you have a great sense of humor and you know quite a bit about what you're looking at. Props to Trevor. Uh, does sitting in a dark room that is rocking and rolling while staring at screens present seasickness problems? Depends on the person. Um, I actually feel pretty good in here as opposed to when I was outside in the mugginess that is the uh, weather right now. Um, but some people looking at a screen would present a problem. Anybody else have issues in here? Um, for me, no, it doesn't present a problem. Um, I don't mind being in here, but it does give you a weird sense of time. Uh, you might come into the van during daylight hours and leave and it'll be dark and it doesn't feel like it should be the time it is. So you kind of lose a little bit of your sense of time when you're in here. Uh, if it's really bad rocking and rolling, it can be hard to stare at screens, um, mainly just because our chairs kind of spin a little, so you got to brace yourself. Yeah, and I, uh, I took a bunch of seasickness pills, so I am feeling all right. <laughs> and you're still awake. You guys are doing all right? Awake. I was going to say, is it drama mean? Because then, then sometimes people fall asleep. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> I think they're all supposed to be drowsy, but I'm okay for now that's good yeah my friends gave me probably 10 five-hour energies before i left to come on this so shout out to my friends at uri i got 50 hours of energy yeah <laughs> someone's asking uh why it seems pretty blue out there with no creatures. Well, when we started, a uh, very cool pilot whale. Um, some creatures like to avoid ROVs and some like to explore them. So just kind of depends on the individual creature and their extrovertedness, I suppose. Yeah, it's actually really interesting uh, about those a different animals and the response to the ROV. Um, to us, it feels like the, the ROV itself is actually extremely uh, quiet since we're watching a video feed, but it does make noise. So we do have hydraulics on the ROV and, and they do make a sound. Um, some creatures could be attracted um, because they are interested in perhaps uh, seeing if there might be something to prey on in that area. Others will actively avoid this large, uh, brightly lit uh, ROV. Um, you can actually see this as we're descending if you have something like a fish finder uh, to see what fish are below the ship. Uh, and they actually seem to actively avoid the ROV. You'll see like the, the scattering layer uh, that vertically migrates uh, up and down throughout the day, and that's made up of a lot of the different vertical migrating animals like copepods and, and, and lantern fishes and other um, animals of that nature. And, and they'll actually actively avoid the ROV as it descends through that part of the water column. Um, other animals can't possibly avoid the ROV. Uh, those are like our planktonic animals, uh, like jellies, uh, siphonophores, and other small things that you might be seeing as we pass by. And I know it looks like you're not seeing much uh, and it just looks like a field of blue, but I'll, there is a lot of life out here in the water column. Uh, this is the largest biome on the planet and there is a lot of biomass here. A lot of the things we're seeing are very small and you can't see it with your naked eye or you'd be able to see it with your naked eye if we weren't moving at 30 meters a minute descending through the water column. But if you keep your eyes peeled, you might see some shrimps as we go down, some jellies. Um, there are a lot of really interesting and uh, fascinating animals that live here in this wide expanse of blue. So do do pay attention to this. this. There, there are really kind of neat things to see here, uh, even if, it doesn't happen as often as when we're on the seafloor, but I, I try to speak up for those water column people. They don't get as much uh, time to explore this really vast area of the ocean.
as I think they should. But, you know, the, the deep sea has a lot of different components and we're mostly interested on what's on the sea floor. Um, I'm a little biased because I, I study deep sea corals and sponges. So I do like seeing all the deep sea corals and sponges and, and describing them and, and sharing my knowledge with people about these animals that I, I really enjoy. So it'll be exciting when we get to the sea floor. Uh, we are a little over halfway there. So we've got another hour and a half, I would say, to get to the bottom. One commenter said they're surprised that we don't have something like gyro seating so the seat stays upright regardless of the waves. That would be so cool. Um, our chairs do kind of have a mechanism that kind of locks them to the floor, so we're not going to slide anywhere. But uh, we do tip a little bit. And gyro seating would be nice. would also be expensive. Sounds Very expensive. Guess. I hear that there's like, if you really want to, you can install like whole cabins that will write themselves which would be yes very expensive <laughs> yeah that, that sounds really fancy um we are an exploration vessel um we're gonna spend that money on our really amazing rov so hercules is definitely gonna get upgrades before our seats get upgrades oh that was was that, was that a squid I didn't see, I saw something float by, it looked really red. Yeah, I just saw like the flash of light. Yeah, that was crazy. Have we ever seen a giant squid or are we in the wrong part of the ocean? I'm new here, I certainly haven't. Um, I do believe they are here. It's very rare to see a giant squid. I think there's only been one occurrence of seeing one alive, and that was in the Gulf of Mexico, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, we could see one, uh, and that would be amazing. What makes a giant squid a giant squid? What is the length or size? I think the size is what makes it. <laughs> Thank you. How, how giant is giant? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> How do you quantify that? Is it not a species? Uh, it is a species. So, so you could have a small giant squid, couldn't you? You could. I mean, they have to start small, like all of us. we got to believe in the small ones, too. You can get there, buddy. <laughs> well, now that you're piping in, I've got a question for you. Hit me with a question. What? Uh, is there any kind of feedback on the ROV controls? Uh, visual yeah. only. There's no force feedback, but I will issue that statement with a caveat. There's a, on the starboard manipulator, there is actually a force feedback setting, but it's really lame and no one uses it. It actually gets you into the sweet feedback loop. If you hit a rock or something, the feedback pushes your hand away. So then your hand pushes back which hits the rock harder, which pushes your hand away, which bounces and it gets all slammy and is not very effective. So yeah, we just use visual feedback. So if there's any up and coming ROV developers, you can work on the feedback controls. Speaking of, it might be time. Was it time to exercise the arms? Exactly. Perfect. So why do we do this exercise? Good question. I ask myself that every day. Um, Building muscle. Yeah. <laughs> it's just to keep the, oops, it's to keep the hydraulic pressures inside the arm at a good, sorry, I'm trying to do two things once here. Uh, Keeps the hydraulic pressures in the arm at a good relative pressure versus the squeeze of the ocean. So do you do this like several times throughout the descent or just? Yeah, every thousand meters or 1500 meters or so. Just depend on 
when we remember. Night mode. Aaron, there's one that maybe you can answer. Video, Aaron. Um, That's me. That's you. <laughs> um, how do you uh, control or manipulate the uh, the color balance on my cameras? So once we hit the bottom, we'll do a white and a black balance. Um, and we do that by having Trevor, the Hercules pilot, move the arm in front of my camera and it has a white, it has white tape on it, and I'll zoom in on that, and I'll do the white balance, and I'll do the black balance. Then we we leave it like that. <laughs> Why don't you do a color balance? What does that mean? Well, your white balance is essentially making sure that you have the colors right. So it's like ah. that's allowing you to have the proper whites in the screen, which in turn will balance other things. And that's also why we have the colored tapes as well. Okay, cool. Because that's kind of your base point then. I use a lot of hands when I talk, and then I realize no one can see it. <laughs> I'm in the corner. I know. I, I've said, like, lots of words already at this watch. It's a good sign. We're going to be a good team. You guys are doing very important operations stuff, but we were back here talking about a team name. One of the commenters asked Ooh. if we had a team name. Wait, are we, well, are we even talking team names? Yeah, I okay. like this. But we're we're going to earn it. We can't just, right like, on. get one. Correct. We have to earn a team name. So everybody yeah. work very hard. I mean, name. is the audience suggesting names? <laughs> we <laughs> asked earlier. Um, Were there any suggestions? Kind of. <laughs> Since we were only, I don't know, half hour into our dive, there was not much to go on. We'd only seen a pilot whale, so there were names about pilot whales. That was pretty, that was a good way to start a dive. So what animal was that? Sorry, I didn't really get a good chance to look at it. It was a pilot whale. It was a pilot whale. It wasn't a dolphin. Um, they're a they're dolphin? related to dolphins. Okay. They're um, a porpoise, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm not really sure know, about actually. common names, but you know, sometimes pilot we call whale. things whales that aren't like that is really very whales. true. Um, they're actually dolphins. Sort of like you know I mean, how look. we call killer whales killer whales, but they're actually related to dolphins and not like baleen whales which cool. is what we would typically think a whale is. But they're in those, those toothed whale uh, group. And that's about all I know about cetaceans. You could tell me anything. I'm believing everyone <laughs> yeah. to say. Shaking my head like, yep. Pilot whales also work uh, in the harbor authorities to bring ships safely into harbor. <laughs> yeah, of I course. I heard that. Yeah. <laughs> Picturing the whale climbing up that they're ladder. They're a dolphin. Yeah, you usually see them in pods. Uh, there's probably more of them around. We just only saw the one hanging out with us. Um, and they have a lot of fun little behaviors that they'll do, uh, especially when they see something really interesting, like uh, an ROV or a research vessel. Uh, they'll, they'll do spy hopping, which is when they just sort of stick their heads out of the water and, and you know check things out. And I've seen them do that behavior before, which is really fun. But definitely good luck for this. So we looked it. We looked it up, and they are not a really porpoise. They are a dolphin. In case thing. anyone was wondering. <laughs> Sorry, it's a what? A porpoise? It's, it's no, it's a dolphin. It's not a porpoise. Oh, okay. And what's the difference? Antonella, I think it's teeth. I know you know this answer. Oh, don't put me on the spot. Um.
we'll get back to you. Front okay, row's doing, doing some operational stuff. stuff. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's more important. Oh yeah, hit me with some more non-operational stuff if you want. <laughs> well, Trevor, one of your fans wants to know how it's going. It's going swell. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> like how swell on a scale of like three to five zero meters. to yeah, three 20 to five feet. meters, yeah. <laughs> Dan says that pilot whales are dolphins with a porpoise. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Dan says that? Didn't he just go home? We don't know which Dan. Commenter Dan. Dan, go play with your blinky lights. Okay, Megan. What is the relation? Oh, oh relation of pilot whales to whales? Oh, this is about half a question. So we'll wait for the follow-up on that question. Um, video Aaron. So you only do white balance on the bottom. If you need to like go change locations um, by quite a depth, do you do a second one or do you just do the one? Most of the time we only do it once. Um, you could technically do it as many times as you wanted, um, but it does take time. So normally we just do it once. I've been on a dive where we did it a couple times actually. It got up really, really shallow. Yeah. And all the sunlight coming in totally messed with it. It made everything yeah, green. Yeah, if, if we were to change by a significant amount, you'd want to do it. But most of the dives that I've been on recently, we really don't change enough to need it. Do you get a, like a quantifiable feedback of what the settings are? Like, can you compare this dive to the previous dive? Um, we could if we really went into the system, I think. Okay, cool. I'd be interested to know. Yeah, this seamount is deep enough that when we get to the summit, it's still going to be basalt. There's probably not going to be a carbonate cap on it. So you're not going to have that real change in, in color that would might require an adjustment in the video balance. But you never know. There could be like a field of sediment which might require a change in the video. A sediment tends to be light colored. And what's, what's that? The sediment. Uh, if we have like a field of sediment. We we normally don't change the white and black balance though due to that. It's oh, okay. more of a depth thing because it's a change in, in like a light, light, a a light, light. Yeah. It's it that if we go to a to a depth where you start getting light then you definitely need a change in black and white balance. Um but if it's something like sediment, that's more of an iris thing. So you're adjusting the amount of light you're letting into the lens. Okay. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we probably wouldn't see any light until we got really shallow. Yeah. Like 500 meters, you might see a tiny bit of light, probably not enough to require any change, though. But like Trevor said, if you make a big enough change, it is always good to do the balance, um, just as a good reference of what the colors are, or what the whites are. Sorry, how far off the bottom are we now? Uh, let me look. Thanks, Trevor. You're welcome. We're 1,300 meters off bottom. Okay. So that's looking at... Oh, I can't do math in my head that fast. 41 minutes to bottom. Okay. So we'll get to the bottom, do the white balance, and hand it over. Yeah, I might slow down a little bit. I'm a little ahead of the inch right now a little bit ahead of Argus but yeah it'll be about a watch change mm -hmm. oh yeah so did I
I got a question about the temperature at the depth that we will be at. Right now, we are at a depth of uh, 2,500-ish meters, and it is at 1.7 degrees Celsius, about what is that, 35 degrees Fahrenheit. So it'll be colder than that once we get to the bottom, I'd assume. A little bit colder. Not quite freezing, though, because then everything would be solid. Yeah, it'll be a little bit colder, but not like a whole bunch, bunch colder um, at that depth. We were pretty down there, um, so you're not going to see as much change with depth at this point. Ooh, another bio question for you, Megan. Uh, can deep water sea fauna see in the dark? Can they see colors? They're wondering why some of them are such wonderful bright colors, yet they live in darkness. So color in the deep sea can actually act as a camouflage. So if you're, say, a red color, um, that actually is the new black in the deep sea uh, because red is the first wavelength of light to attenuate. So uh, if you're you know, a reddish color, that'll make you darker than other things. Um, some animals do have visual capabilities. Um, I'm not sure if any can actually differentiate color, but I assume they do because there is um, different colors of bioluminescence that these animals produce. So some produce a green or a blue, so they might have um, photoreceptors that are able to pick up that type of light. So they, they can see probably some color, but a lot of animals might not be able to see any color. Some animals might only be able to use their eyes to detect the presence or absence of light. And that's what a lot of animals have in the deep sea is be able to detect presence or absence of light uh, and not necessarily see in the same way we do uh, because there isn't a lot of light down there. So you're not gonna have full color vision and you're not gonna depend on your vision for navigation and living your life. So um, vision can be important for certain species, but some species don't even have eyes in the deep sea. There are a few fish that um, don't have eyes uh, and are uh, able to live full and enjoyable lives without that visual um, cue. And there are other animals that do have eyes and can use them in different ways. I can't remember, do hagfish have eyes? No, right? Hagfish, um, they don't have true eyes. They have like um, the ability to detect the presence and absence of light. They have like these sort of eye pads on either side of their head. That's eye pads, not eye pads. Correct. No, not like, I, yeah, they have <laughs> eye pads with them, and they gotta check their emails and play on with their apps. Um, no, I, I'm not sure the exact term of the type of. Um, pseudo eye they have but yeah they they don't have true eyes but they can detect a light with that sort of like pseudo eye that they actually have they are a weirdly simplistic yet very complicated creature they are uh, the amount of mucus that they can produce is no. just phenomenal same with my roommate <laughs> <laughs> It is insane. <laughs> Maybe they're related. Would not be surprised. <laughs> you may not have a room to a roommate or a room to go back to when you get back. They might, <laughs> you might, your stuff might be out on the lawn. Oh, it's it's fine. I have another roommate. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone know what the pressure is at the bottom, or I should say, at the depth that we're going to? So around. Uh, 3,900 meters. I would say the ROV pilots would be the best ones to ask about that. I would say so. If only I was listening. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. You were doing your very important job. Do you know approximately what the pressure is going to be like at about 3,900 meters? The pressure? Yes. Uh, I want to say it's... Uh, uh, what is it, one atmosphere per 10 meters, I think? Which makes it 14 PSI every 10 meters. So you do 14. the math. 7. <laughs> so you do the math at home. And come and I, back to us. Anyway, at 4,000 meters is 6,000 PSI approximately. That's I'm shy of it. It's a lot.
And for reference, about how deep can a human dive? Does anybody know that? I've heard of people going to extreme depths with special equipment. Depends on what you mean, I guess. A, or a recreational diver, like a scuba diver, generally gets certified to, I don't know, 30 or 40 meters. Yeah, a deep dive might be 60 meters, but that's pushing it. Totally. That's pretty specialty at that point. 60 meters versus 38 at 3,900 meters. Humans don't do well on the diving front. I don't think you want that pressure. <laughs> One, um. Sweet. That's fine. They saw it before. It's because we have all those, like, gas chambers in our bodies for some reason. Weird. Um, it's like we need to breathe to, or yeah, something. Yeah, like we need to breathe or something, and then air is compressible. It makes it hard to dive very deep. That's true. But it's amazing that some whales can actually dive to these depths and they'll feed at these depths. So it's it's not impossible for uh, air breathing organisms to make it down here, which I, I just find amazing. I hear that some whales don't have swim bladders. Is that right? And they just like store the, what is it, the oxygen or the carbon in their bones rather than like using swim bladders? Am I crazy? Um, I don't think whales have swim bladders. Fish have like right. bladders. Just fish. Okay. Uh, I'm not exactly sure uh, how whales are adapted uh, to be able to do dives that deep, but I'm sure there's a lot of physiological adaptations that make it possible. But again, I study invertebrates, so not really up on my my whale. Tip the camera all the way up. Physiology. Mm. It has been going and yeah, I'm just tilting it up. If you are just tuning in, this is the first dive of the expedition Lu'ua'ea Ahiki Ke Kualunakai. We are descending upon unnamed seamount C, and right now we are just watching the ROVs cruise down. We've got probably another 45 minutes or so of uh, time before we hit bottom. We are currently at 2,800 meters. Here's a biology question. What do deep sea creatures live on? Do they require oxygen? How do they draw it out of the water? So, yes, they um, they do live on oxygen and it, it, there is dissolved oxygen in the water. So there are areas in the deep ocean where there is an oxygen minimum and 
animals that live in those very low oxygen areas are actually specially adapted um, to live in those areas. But you'll notice that if we were to go through an area like that, there would be a lot fewer animals than what you would expect to see, uh, or what you, what you might see uh, on this seamount where we're not experiencing that oxygen minimum zone. So yes, they are breathing oxygen that is dissolved in the water. Oh no, now we have a lot of questions about whales and diving and fortunately I don't think any of us are experts on vertebrate sea mammals. <laughs> so we would probably be giving you answers with question marks at the end of this. Yeah, I can, I can do my best to try to answer some questions, but um, again, I don't know that much about the subject matter. Uh, and I wouldn't want to speculate on too many things and give you guys the uh, wrong information um, because I, I'm not an expert here. But there are a lot of really good experts out there. Um, there's a lot of good literature out there uh, explaining what we do know about some of these animals. Looks like we've got a fresh batch of people tuning in. Um, yes, we are descending. Our target is to descend to approximately 3,900 meters. Um, and then we'll be working up the slope of unnamed seamount C to approximately uh, 1,825 meters. That's the goal. Front row, do you have a chance to answer an ROV question? Yeah. Right. Do you have different length umbilical cables, or is it just a single roll? Uh, at any given time, it's just a single roll. But this isn't the first one we've had on board. We've gone through several several inter yeah whoa, several iterations of different cables, different winch configurations. Um, yeah, this is, I don't know, the fourth or fifth one I've personally seen on board. Um, different lengths, different capabilities, etc. But at any given moment, there's only one on board. We were talking about this earlier, but just as a refresher, Megan, um, how do we bring up samples from extreme pressures without damaging them? So when we collect our um, specimens at depth, we put them in our um, bio boxes. And, and these boxes are going to hold water that is the same temperature at the area where they were collected, which is really important for these animals because we don't keep them cold. Um, the temperature down here is is very close to freezing, so we need to keep those animals cold. Otherwise, um, the tissues might start to degrade before we're able to preserve them. Um, so we put them in our bio boxes, and the water will stay that same temperature mostly uh, as we ascend to the surface, and we quickly try to preserve those samples before they have any time to degrade at the surface. Again, uh, the animals that we collect will not arrive to the surface alive. Um, that's a really big change in, in pressure, and that pressure change does cause these animals um, to die, which is sad, but um, they are helping us learn more 
about the deep sea and, and they're very valuable specimens to science. So we don't just collect things um, willy-nilly and we want to make very sure that we're collecting something that's going to be important and be used uh, because they are very fragile, fragile ecosystems on the deep sea. We don't want to just like take things um, that we don't need. So uh, that's why we do this type of ROV exploration. It's a lot about visually seeing what's down there, um, collecting these snapshots of the community and, and really leaving as little trace of ourselves as possible. Um, other than that, uh, we aren't going to be able to collect fish uh, just because fish will actively avoid us. Um, they're, they're not going to allow us to just pick them up off the sea floor. But if we were to collect, say, a fish, um, bringing them up from the steps, uh, the pressure change does have effects on their body. Um, you'll notice that their eyes might pop out. Uh, and that's, that's how the blobfish really got its name. The blobfish uh, doesn't actually look anything like those pictures you might see on social media. Um, that's the fish as it looks like on the surface after going su through such an immense pressure change from coming up from the deep, uh, allowing, and that like makes its tissues bloat and uh, its eyes pop out. And actually at depth, it's kind of cute. It looks like a normal fish. Oh, it's kind of like pouty little lips, but it doesn't have that silly nose and, and that sort of really blobby look to it when it's alive in its natural environment. Um, and a number of different animals have some responses to being collected. Um, say like our, our bamboo coral might be collected and it produces a mucus um, as a stress response from uh, being picked up and brought to the surface. So when we have animals like that, uh, we do have to be careful not to contaminate anything uh, of other samples in our lab because there's going to be this mucus production. Um, so we got to keep things clean and, uh, and, and quickly preserve our samples after we've recovered them. I was surprised the first time I saw a normal blobfish, a non a non blob blobfish, a blobfish at depth. I was like, oh, that does. I would not be able to pick that fish out of a lineup. It just looks like a perfectly average fish. I got a question: Is the ROV tethered on a cable? It is. Uh, we actually have two ROVs out right now. So we have the ship. The ship is connected to Argus, and Argus is connected to um, ROV. Hercules. Um, Aaron Navigator, actually, do you have time to talk about what you do? Because I was fascinated when I found out about the role of navigation on this cruise. You're fascinated by the role of navigation? Er, uh, your navigation, <laughs> what you do with Argus. <laughs> well, I don't, I mean, I move the ship. The ship moves Argus. I don't, I don't feel like I'm personally responsible for Argus. Well, I mean, you communicate, <laughs> like, I didn't know that Argus didn't have, like, wasn't as mobile as Hercules, and basically it depended oh. on where the ship was. Yeah, yeah. Argus can only uh, do so much, right? Yeah, so we have to make sure the ship's in position. And honestly, I don't even do that. I just ask somebody else very nicely to do it for us. Um, I We figure out where we need Argus to be, and then yeah, we call the, the bridge, and they we ask them to make uh, position changes to their DP system, and then that will get Argus... Where Argus needs to be, and then Herc can go where Herc needs to go. So um, at these depths, it could be pretty slow. Um, so you'll learn as we're doing the doing the dives that it's um, a lot of waiting sometimes because the ship moves. The ship moves at a, a a pretty good clip, but then for Argus to actually respond to that move through three thousand, four thousand meters of water it takes um, takes a while. So you'll hear us say something like, "Oh, we're waiting for Argus to settle out," and that's why we're we're just waiting for Argus to um, kind of shift underneath the, the ship to the new position. And we want Argus to be is it directly under the ship. Is that the goal? Well, the, the Argus will lay out below the ship within like 20 meters of the stern of the ship, typically. And so that's what we kind of, what you kind of plan on. And then Herc just has the length of its tether. So if Argus is too far away, Herc, you'll, you'll hear Trevor say he's at the end of his tether. 
uh, just means that he doesn't have any room to go in any direction, so we have to bring Argus uh, closer to where he wants to go. It's kind of like a dog walking a, or, or a human walking a dog walking a dog. Like, yeah. you know, the chef is walking Argus, Argus is walking her. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. So, yeah, we, I mean, we try to make it so it goes pretty smoothly, but sometimes um, it depends. And if the if science calls for a sample or something, um, we often have to, like, stop the ship and Trevor and Antonella will sometimes be able to quickly sample, but if Argus is uh, is lagging behind, um, you might tell hear him say that you know we don't, we'll have to either do this fast or we don't have time to sample because Argus is going to get pulled by the ship. So it's a lot of like listening and and planning and trying to keep on top of what we think science is going to want um, before it happens. And about how long is Turk's tether like maximum? Trevor, what's her, the tether? Sorry, thirty. Tether right now is 30 meters, yes. Yep, thanks. What is its max? Pardon me? Is, the, is that the max? Uh, max I've ever seen on here was 52, 53, but you can put whatever length you want. Longer is more gangly, more tangly, and also gives Herc a lot more freedom. So there's benefits and negatives to each way. Got 900 meters to go. Getting there.
had a question about how many dives we're anticipating during this expedition. Um, we are not sure. <laughs> For us, somewhere between five and six, perhaps. It kind of depends on you know, how each dive goes. We're kind of shooting for longer dives this time, so we will see. Also, depends on the weather and water conditions, so there's quite a few variables. Um, we were doing a little bit of mapping at the beginning, but it turns out that this area, uh, we have quite a bit of mapping data on it, so we didn't have to do as much as anticipated. Suggested team name, Roommates of the Deep. We'll have to put that one in our back pocket. How many interactions did you have you done already? Me personally, or just our team? Your team so far. Uh, let me look. Give me a second. Didn't we have a, a pretty lofty goal for interactions this year? Do you guys know how close we are to meeting that? I think they're really close to meeting it. They must be. Yeah. I mean, they've crazy. been nonstop. Yeah. So been, many. It's been pretty wild. So just today, we, today was our first day doing interactions and we had six. I believe we have five or six tomorrow and we have approximately five to six every weekday for this whole cruise. So nice. it's going to be pretty I, I wonder what the goal is. There was a goal. Is it 3,000 right. or something? I don't know. Something, I something that I was like, oh my goodness. That's, and the number of kids they reached was, was some crazy number it was 300 i don't know i don't know but there was a goal well each of our well not each but many of our interactions today were multiple classroom interactions so you know we're not just reaching a few kids or a few, you know just one class per interaction necessarily sometimes we're reaching entire schools also um now that everybody knows how to work remotely <laughs> thanks to uh, some of our changes that we've had in the last two years, um, we can also reach kids that are uh, remote learning. So we can like pull them all in from their various homes and uh, reach them that way. So great. What's what was your favorite question you got today? Ooh, my favorite question. To think about that one, I did. I did appreciate uh, the kid that we talked to today. That was an artist. Yeah, that was cute. <laughs> but I don't, I don't know about my favorite question. Oh, they did ask, how do we live on the ship? <laughs> so, <laughs> how do you gonna, live with yourself? How do you live? <laughs> and uh, what what types of people, like how many people does it take to run the ship? And I made sure to mention that our, uh, our uh, food staff is one of the most important people that we have on the ship because... <laughs> We need fuel, just like the ship needs fuel. <laughs> Can you imagine what would happen if they just, you know, decided we're not going to cook today? It would be pandemonium. <laughs> Got a question. How do we map the ocean floor? Does it use lasers or sonar? We use a multi-beam system. Does anybody have very detailed information on this. I can talk about it. If somebody has more details than I do, I'd love for them to talk about it instead. I am I can talk about that. Um, I'm a mapper by training. Uh, this is Aaron Navigation. So yes, we use a 30 kilohertz multi-beam sonar. I think it has, uh, let's say, 400 and some beams. Um, we send out an acoustic pulse. Um, it goes down to the seafloor and it returns. And we know from the time it took and the sound speed in water, um, than what the depth of the seafloor is. And it's doing that, it's sending out a ping um, in this depth of water, something like every 10 seconds is pretty slow because um, it's pretty deep. Um, and from that, we get a, a pretty nice continuous picture of the seafloor. The resolution at these depths tends to be 60 to 100 meters. So we're getting a couple of those measurements per 60 or 100 meter box. And we put that together into um, a nice picture of the seafloor. We also get, in addition to the depth information, we also get intensity of the signal, and that's what we call the backscatter. We get seafloor backscatter, which um, we can use to um, kind of make an estimate of what the, the seafloor looks like. 
or um, and also we get backscatter in the water column so if we encounter if the the multi encounters any targets in the water column um, they will show up um, depending on their impedance contrast with water they may show up really nicely acoustically so things like bubbles or animals that have bubbles in them will show up really brightly in the acoustics um, and we'll get we'll get a signal on them as well was that enough detail you want more <laughs> <laughs> That was a lovely amount of detail, thank you. Yeah. I am sort of a mapper. I'm, I'm a cartographer, but I don't directly map things. So I just have the general surface knowledge of the mapping procedures. Yeah, I, I have a GIS background too. Um, and it, it's quite interesting how how different it is. Like a, the GIS background is great for um, understanding, like that helped me understand projections and things like that. And then making a lot of the products that, that we use here for our dive plans and stuff. but um, understanding the ocean mapping was very much a, a study in acoustics and positioning. Um, and it's interesting, people who are in the ocean mapping realm are often like kind of five steps behind on the, the GIS stuff because they're just more focused on uh, on the acoustic side. Right. Yeah, I did my um, GIS program and then I like on my own did like kind of like an overview of hydrography and I find it fascinating. But it was one of those things that like if I'm not using it right this second, I don't have all of the detailed information at hand. It's not on the top of my brain. <laughs> but I think it is really interesting uh, learning about the history of acoustics. I have a question. What is the speed of the descent to the bottom earlier? It was uh, 30 meters per minute. Probably sitting right around there still. Trevor, do you have time to answer a fan question? Um, they're trying to troubleshoot a few things right now. Um, maybe in a, f a minute or two, he might be able to answer. Sounds good. Thank you. Did you guys hide my camera again? <laughs> what was that? Never.
Yeah, I already know. Right, this is actually a question for uh, both ROV pilots, although Trevor, you were mentioned because you are very popular. Um, how did you get into piloting RV or ROVs? Um, I'll go first because Trevor's working on something. Um, I started uh, as an intern in 2018 on this ship, although I had started with some smaller observation class ROVs, um, much, much smaller than these. Um, you can pick them up yourself, no manipulators. Um, that was for my PhD research. But then 2018, I came out here um, as an Argus pilot and have been coming out ever since. And as a follow-up question, do either of you ever fly drones or RC planes, even as a hobby? Sorry, can you say again? I said as a follow-up, do either of you um, fly drones or RC planes, even as a hobby? I don't know. <laughs> 